In the name of the one holy and risen Lord. Amen. There's a story of a five-year-old boy named Brian who had an important role in his church's Easter pageant. His line was, he's not here, he's risen. Unfortunately, like a lot of five-year-olds, Brian had trouble remembering his line. His mom practiced with him all week. He's not here, he's risen. He's not here, he's risen. But Brian just had a lot of problems. So on the day of the Easter pageant, Brian, Brian's mom sat in the very front row of the church. And at the moment of his line, sure enough, his mind went blank. He just couldn't remember. So his mom, being a good mom, sat and whispered, he's not here, he's risen. And Brian became very confident and shouted out proudly, he's not here, he's in prison. Misunderstanding the message of Easter is a long-standing tradition in the church. So if you feel skeptical this morning about whether or not a man could be raised from the dead, or if you're feeling a little uncertain and out of place about even being here this morning, well, you have come to exactly the right church because there is no question you could ask, no doubt you could have, that has not been had by pretty near every serious Christian. 2,000 years later, it is still a challenging story. Jesus had a humble background, but extraordinary gifts, the ability to heal, the ability to speak truth to power, to see possibilities in the forgotten, to bring wholeness to those broken by the world, and to find abundance where others only saw scarcity. But those very gifts brought him into conflict with political and religious leaders, and he was killed. This, of course, is the part of the story we can understand. After all, many of us watched the protesters in Tiananmen Square. We learned in school about the assassinations of Abraham Lincoln, Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr., Alexei Navalny. It is not news to us that the cost of standing up to the powers of this world include death. Of course they do. We know they do. So no wonder that so many Christians will say, I believe in Jesus and in his teachings, but don't ask me to believe in the resurrection. We meet Mary Magdalene in the gospel this morning in the midst of her grief. Her teacher, her rabbi, has been assassinated, and she has come in the darkness to his tomb. Maybe she came in the darkness because of the fear of being seen Maybe darkness is a spiritual term. She has come to his grave in a place of despair or doubt. Maybe she just couldn't sleep because her mind kept coming back to those terrible events of Good Friday. But when she comes to grieve him, she finds that the stone has been rolled away. The body is gone. And her grief has turned to despair, a bad thing that turns into a worse thing. Mary Magdalene has had her heart broken, and now Jesus' body is missing. Remember that in the Jewish tradition, bodies must be buried very quickly. 
She is beside herself. What happens next is what I find most interesting about this passage, most compelling. Jesus is standing there with her, and she does not recognize him. They exchange words, he asks her questions, and still she doesn't know who he is until he says her name. When we talk about resurrection, I think most of us imagine a restoration. The way you used to be able, when your computer crashed, to reset it to the last point at which it functioned properly. We imagine that Jesus comes back from the dead and people rejoice. It is almost as though the events of Maundy Thursday and Good Friday and the Easter vigil did not even happen. But that is not what the Bible tells us. In story after story in these next weeks of Easter, those closest to Jesus will not recognize him. They will walk beside him. They will ask him questions. They will have discussions. They will not know who it is they are talking to. He is a new thing, a new person. Fred Craddock writes, the resurrection is not a return to the past, but a movement to the future. Jesus' physical appearance has changed. His resurrected self is a new thing. Even those closest to Jesus do not recognize him in this new thing. If you have been a member of this church for a while, you might remember our friend Patrick. Pat was already here when I moved to Poughkeepsie in 2015. He's a big guy, maybe 6'3", reddish hair. He looked like the kind of guy who had played football in high school, maybe a tackle. I never really understood how Pat came to claim this church as his home, but he did. When he was in a good place, he was the most helpful guy in the world, polite, kind. Every Sunday when he'd come to church, he would take special care to go through the box of clothes that he kept in the undercroft, to wash himself, put on a fresh shirt, look sharp. But he has some mental health problems. And he, when he went into a rage, it was scary. He never hurt anybody on this campus. But he was so large that if he yelled or came close when he was in one of those moods, it was awful. More than once, I had to ask him to leave the building and take his language outdoors. To make matters worse, he drank. And to make matters even worse, I suspected that he used drugs. He was homeless for most of the last 10 years, and every time he would get some help, and he tried, it just wasn't the right kind of help. And as much as we would be hopeful about a new social worker or medication, a new job or apartment, well, the truth is not too much later, he would show up again getting drunk on our front staff steps or yelling at the staff or at the neighbors. There was something about him though. He was lost. 
but he kept trying. And I prayed along with many of you for Patrick to be found. About eight months ago, I drove Patrick to the hospital. He was hearing voices. He couldn't sleep. He was scared. And I asked him if he would go. And he said, if you go with me. So we went to Mid Hudson. I waited until he was admitted there. And then I left. A few weeks later, he told us that his new social worker had found him a place to go in Queens. We helped her pack a bag for him, pretty sure that we would see him again in a week or two. A few weeks later, we got a call from Patrick. He asked us to send him cigarettes and his mail, so we did. Every month for the last six months or so, it is gone like that. He calls the office, tells us he's fine, asks us to send his mail and three packs of Newport 100s, and we do. It has become a kind of regular update at our staff meetings. And we're all glad to hear from him. And truth be told, it has been much quieter around the church without him here. But about 10 days ago, I got a call from Patrick on my cell phone. He told me that he had been sober for seven months. He goes to group therapy every day. He goes to AA. He's living in supportive housing he has a counselor that he likes. And he wanted me to know that he got a job at Shea Stadium. He will be on the maintenance crew for the Mets home games and concerts and soccer games. And I told him how proud I was of him. And then he said, that he had been doing his amends, thinking about all the people he hurt when he was drinking and using drugs. And he wanted me to know that he was sorry that he had done those things because it was disrespectful. And he wanted me to know that. And he said, the people at church gave me nothing but love. I love you all. And I said, we love you too, Pat, and we're proud of you. Resurrection is not a return to the way things were. Resurrection is a new beginning, a new life. We make a terrible mistake if we think that Jesus's resurrection is only a challenge to the laws of biology. Resurrection is about the possibility of a new future when every bit of evidence argues against it. Resurrection is about the limitless possibility for new life. Resurrection is the ultimate test of our faith, the completion of Jesus's teaching in the world. It is the attitude, the belief, the perspective that makes Christians different than every other faith. There is no situation we believe. There is no situation, no person, no city, no country, no border, no relationship, no diagnosis, so desperate that God cannot raise it up and offer new life. 
Christians are called Easter people because we believe that God is working in and through the broken and rough places in us and in those around us. We are called to look for the possibility of new life in every death, to look for the light shining in the deepest darkness and the hope in the midst of despair. Easter is not about a day or a bunny or your favorite hymn. Easter is about a way of looking at the world, looking at what is in it and expecting praying for God to do a new thing and raise up that which we had given up hope for because we believe this is our God and Jesus resurrected is our Lord. Amen.